This conference will now be recorded. All right, so NTP. So back in the day, it used to be NTP.com. And then I think in real, I don't know, probably six or seven, Cronny D came out for Red Hat. All right, so here, the purpose of um, maintaining accurate time, after completing the section, you should be able to maintain accurate time synchronization with the network time protocol and configure the time zone to ensure timestamps for the events recorded by the system journal and the logs, right? So if I want to get up to, up to second, up to minute, up to minute second information about you know, if I restarted my database server and I want to see, like, when I restart the, the database service, like system CTL, the service of it, how long does it take for my database to actually come back up, right? That's going to be important if you had to reboot a database that had so many records or, you know, just different connections and so forth. Like, how long does it take to drop those connections and how long does it take to reboot? Because that's something that you can estimate as an outage or, or what have you, right? So um, here um, they're showing you, they have what they call the time date CTL command, right? So system time synchronization is critical, critical for log files across multiple systems, right? Just even your, even at home, your, your time is critical. Even when you look at your ring and the logs from your ring, the time is critical, right? And it says the network protocol is a standard way to, uh, for a machine to provide and obtain correct time information over the internet. A machine might get accurate time information from public NTP servers, but here's the thing. If that NTP port is blocked, then it won't get accurate time because the port is blocked. So such as the NTP, the NTP, NTP pool project. Another option is to sync a uh, high quality hardware clock to to uh, serve accurate time to local clients. And that's what I was talking about. Like you can have the hardware clock on your on your desktop or your machine. So here they run, they run the time date CTL command. So let's do this and let's do this and let's do this. And let's pick this one. All right. Um and you I'll be full screen. Um, clear. Cuts me off. Um, but we can do, I guess I could do that. That ain't too bad. And I can make this a little bigger. Oh, it's not getting any bigger. But that's okay. All right. So here, um, when I type date, right, that gives me the today's date and the time, but it's Eastern Standard Time at, at 8.36, right? And it gives me the actual um, year. But we all know that I have switches that I could use because we can use the man page and then type man date. And it tells you like, here's an option and here's a format so I can format my date, right? You know, I can, I, instead of it being how I saw, I can format my output, right? Um, and they're going to get more into this in the chapter, but I just want to highlight using the man pages in order to um, format your information. All right, so here, um, when you're going through these chapters, um, these are just example, uh, this is just the example. And then when you get in the lab, the lab should reiterate what, what they just went through. So here, time, date, um, CTL, and I'm going to type dash dash help. So here, as you can see, pull this over here. Uh, you can see I have status to show the current time settings. I have show the properties. I can set the time, I can set the time zone, I can list my time zones, um, time sync, show the status of system D, time sync, show properties and so forth. So here, let's, let's do time, date, CTL, show status. So let's clear, we can use our up arrow to get our last commands and then we'll do uh, show 
right? So it's telling me there's New York, uh, NTP, and then there's NTP synchronization going on, uh, time use, second Wednesday, and then RTC. Now, and when I type in status, um, you can see local universal RTC, the time zone, and so forth, right? And then it's RTC in, in the local time zone. Nope. And is an NTP service is active, right? So let's 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 go. Let me see. Let's type system CTL status um, NTP. Is it NTPD? It's NTP. All right. So that's not there. But if I type in Crony, Crony D. Yep. So here's Crony D, and it's telling me that it's running. Like I said, they switched over from NTP D to chronic D, right? And then we're gonna get more into that. All right, so now they say now play with the command list of time zones. So here, let's play with list time zones. All right. So we're gonna quit that. We're gonna clear our screen. We're gonna use the up arrow because I'm lazy, right? And then we're going to type list dash time zones, but I know it's going to scroll off the screen. So I'm going to pipe that over to head dash n five. Oh, what happened? I don't know why I did that. N five, right? It's just giving me the first, the first, the first top, the first uh, five of that. But if I didn't do that, if I just did this, you see it scrolls off my screen. And so it gives me all of Africa, all of the Americas, all of Asia, uh, Australia, I mean, Europe, um, Jamaica, and so forth, right? Um, and let's see how many it actually gives us. So we're going to clear our screen. And we're going to take that and we're going to pipe that over to um, TZs or TZ. On TZS doctors, right? And then we're gonna cat TZS dot text, and then we're gonna say, give me a word uh, count line by line. There's 595 choices that I get to choose from for my time zone. All right, all right. So um, here's another thing you can do is um. You can come up here and pipe that over to grep and say you live in uh, the Midwest. Um, you could probably see, I know you could do New York. I wonder if do they have Colorado. No, they don't. So let's go, we know New. So here in New York and North Dakota. I didn't see Colorado. What's an, I don't know what's another one out here. Let's see, let's go time zones um, and let's grab for America. And I'm ignoring the case. So uh, let's see what we get. We got Vancouver, North Dakota, Los Angeles, Kentucky. Oh no, what will be close to? M MST. Who else is in MST? But I think I also saw MST. So you could just set it to MST. All right, that All right. All right, so let's get back to it. All right, so they tell you a little history here about uh, internet assigned number authority provides a public time zone database, right? Um, IANA I, I names the time zone based on the continent or the ocean and typically the largest city in within the time zone region. Oh, so here it is, Denver, mountain is Denver, right? So if you ever wonder how to get to that. 
All right, then it goes into the locality. Some localities inside the time zone have a different daylight saving time zone. For example, in the US, much of the state of Arizona does not have a, a daylight saving time adjustment at all and is in the time zone um, and is in the time zone America Phoenix, right? And then they have TZ select uh, command to identify the correct time zones and so forth. So here, this is where we set the time zone. Um, so let's do let's do um, Denver. And let's scroll up. So let's do time um, date. CTL set as time zone. And then we can do America slash Denver. And before I do, I want to do something else. I want to give it, uh, we, we did time date CTL um, status. Oops, status. And we can see it's in New York. And I'm saying put it into uh, Denver. Mm -mm -mm. No? No, it ain't like me. I was trying to be fancy. Time date CTL set the time zone. And then let's do America and Denver. And now when we, when we do date or time date CTL status, we can see now we moved over to Denver. You can see the time change and you can see the, the um, timestamp when you make files would change too. If you need to use the coordinated universal time UTC or a particular server, then set the time zone to select UTC to zone to UTC, and that's using the TZ select command. And this um, command does not include the name of the UTC, but you can set the time zone with UTC using the time date CTL. All right, so here, remember before we said you can set the time, right? So if my time was off, like your time might be off because the clock is running behind or it's about to die, or something's about to fail, you can then set the time zone. I mean, you can set the time, the, the actual time on it, right? So they got local time, MST, UTC, and then they also have the uh, time zone and whether or not that was synchronized. And we saw that earlier. All right, so here, the time date set NTP options enable, enables or disable NTP synchronization. So here they're saying like, hey, I need to sync up with a clock or time, a clock outside of our environment or within our environment. So let's do time, date, CTL, set up, dash NTP, and let's do dash dash help. Because I want to know what my other options are. I don't want to know just about them. So we're doing a time date CTL set NTP. It's a Boolean. So you say enable or disable time synchronization. True or false? Right? That's what they want to, that's what they want to see there. True or false. Right? All right. It says in Red Hat 9, this this command. Adjust whether the chronic DNT NTP service is enabled. Other Linux distributions might still might use the setting um, to adjust a different NTP um, simple network and enable and disable NTP on other you with other utilities in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, such as graphical known. So when they're talking about graphical known. They're actually talking about the actual GUI interface, just like your Mac, when you log into your Mac, or when you log into your Windows box, you have you actually have a GUI, right? So that's what they're talking about there, right? All right, any questions so far? I've been talking, I, I didn't ask you if you had questions. All 
Any questions so far? Does this make sense? It's pretty straightforward. Mm, I'm assuming yes. Okay. All right. So configure and monitor the chronic D servers, right? So let's let's sudo to root here. And I'm I think it's right here. It may be stupid. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And I want to do a yum search. I'm just going to type in time. All right. That's a lot of information, but you can see what comes back, though. But that's no, you know, there. Let's do NTP or yum info NTP. How about NTPD? Fine, yeah, I'm install the GPD. Oh, you don't have it? Uh, hmm, interesting. Oh, metadata. Oh, yum, repo list. I'm trying to see what, what my repos are. Oh, okay. Oh, yum, search, NTP. Uh, they just got NTP stat. Oh, so I guess as the as you roll into nine, NTP is really being snatched out. So you have to you're forced to use Chrony. Yeah, here's Chrony, a NTP client server. All right. All right. So let's get back to it. All right, so Crony D is the service, like the actual service to to actually get Crony working, right? Like system CTL Crony um, is the thing. So I did this before, um, but let's do this RPM dash QA a QILC, and let's uh, grab. Oh uh, no, let's do Crony D. Oh, Crony D not installed? That's not true. Yeah, let's go here. What's it called, Crony? Yeah. All right, so here's the information about Crony. It tells you right here where um, the architecture, uh, the who, who's the vendor of it, Here's a brief description and then a list of the files that probably get installed when you install Crony. And then they also give you one of one of, one of the most important things uh, that they give you here is this signature. They give you this signature, so you can go back and identify whether or not somebody tampered with your one of your packages or whatnot. That's what this comes from. Cool so far. All right, so let's do one other thing. I showed you when I did this command up here, let me clear. When I did this command, I said, give me information. Um, also, I want configuration files. So it gave me a list, you see down here, of configuration files uh, for Crony D or Crony. And then the gauge will give me the Cisco bit chronic D. So it gave me some information about it um, when we installed it. And where it told me what config files are. So here we can see that if no network is available, then chronic D server calculates the RTC clock drift and records it in a file. And that that file it records it in, in the file that the drift file value specifies in Etsy crony, crony.com. So let's go and look at crony.com. Because these are the files right here that got chopped on here. So let's see, uh, crony.com. 
And so here is it's got a server that is set up on 172, 25, 54, 54. All right, so let's do this. Let's go back to our our lab environment. Let's go back to table of contents. And let's go look um, here. 254, 254. I bet you that's probably this one here. It's probably this one here. Because I don't see, well, it could be. Yeah, it's got to be this one. It's 250.254. Let's go back and see what that was. That was chapter 11. Oh, no. The end of chapter 11. And they were showing... What was it at? It's, oh, it's this one. Right here. Yeah, 254, 254. That's something else. It's not in our net. It's not, it's not none of the machines that they're showing us with the IP address. It may be that classroom. All right. So now when we have this, now they want to say, okay, well, um, we have what we call uh, the stratum, right? So the stratum of the NTP time source determines its quality. And this is important because you can have, you could be working with an NTP server and, them, and those people just letting it run automatically and they're not keeping up with that. It's the, the, their time server is drifting or, or failing and so forth, right? So here um, they're saying the stratum, it determines the number of hops the machine is away from the high performance reference clock. So if you on the East Coast, you don't want to try to sync up with a time server all the way on the West Coast, because you know, that's that's a not the fact that it's a time change, it's just the fact of the distance, right? You want you want you want your time to come back pretty quickly. All right. It says the reference clock is a stratum zero time source. A NTP server that is directly attached to the reference clock is in the stratum of one, while a machine that synchronizes time for from the NTP server is a stratum of two, the time source. So here they're going to talk about the configuration files. It says the first argument of the server line is the IP address or the DNS of the NTP server. And they're talking about up here at the top. I'll show you that in a minute. And then they say uh, the following, following the server IP address or the name, you can list a series of options for the server. So normally when, when I, I remember when I did NTP, I would want to get, I would sync up with three different servers um, just to get accurate time, right? And it says you can list a series of options um, for the server, Red Hat recommends using the iBurst option. So here's where they use the iBurst option, right here. But you can list uh, a you know a set of servers here. They could have connected to uh, rail uh, dot uh, dot org servers, but they didn't. They used something within the classroom. All right. So um, here. And saying, as an example, with the following server, uh, classroom uh, example.com, I burst line in the xcrony.com file, uh, configuration file, the crony D service uses the classroom as its NTP time source, as its source of truth. And they're showing you you can restart. So let's go over here. I'm not going to restart, but I just want to show you what your options are here. So system, CTL, um, you can do status um, of chrony D. It's already started, right? You can also do um, reload in case you change the configuration file, you can reload the actual service. Uh, it's not applicable. Okay, I'm gonna let you do that one. 
I didn't change anything either. So, and then you can do the restart. And then remember, we were talking about log files, right? So if I did a tail dash in dash five on var log messages, you can see I got some output from my NTP server, right? From this, I restarted the service. You see, I got some output, right? Uh, the generate command key is no longer supported. Uh, here's the here's the drift they were talking about. Um, and also the the selected source um, of where it's trying to sync up at, right? So let's get back over here. All right, so now here they're saying the crony C command acts as a client for crony D servers. After setting up an NTP synchronization, verify the local uh, system is seamlessly using NTP server, using the NTP server to synchronize the system clock by running crony C sources. Let's do that. Crony C sources dash V. All right. All right, so now it tells you some information, right? It gives you the IP um, of what it's syncing with. And it gives you a stratum, meaning like, remember they were talking about the number of hops, so it's three hops. Um, last RX, is, this is a, your, I think it's a, like TX RX receiving. All right, and then this last sample. So let's go see what they're talking about, what these, what this means here, All right? Um, they got the polling reachability uh, server opto. Oh, here, last example, or last, last, and then sample. All right, so let's go read this so it makes sense to us. All right, the star, I mean, the asterisk, is in uh, the source state, and let me see what it here. And then it says that this field indicates that Kernel D servers uses the classroom.example uh, com. That's fine. That's what we had configured. That's what we had figured right here. And this and it didn't tell me what the what the up arrow or the carrots are. I'm seeing carrots. Did I miss it? Oh, carrot is equal to server, right? Are y'all following along with this diagram? Want me to explain a little more? Yeah, I think you should explain it a little bit more. All right, so remember we talked about stratum. Let me go back up here. And stratum was the number of hops away, right? Stratum is the NTP time source the ter the source determines its quality. The stratum determines the number of hops the machine is away from a high performance reference clock. In this case over here, when we did stratum, right, we see it's, it's three hops away, meaning it's local in that network too, right? And it's nearby. You want your NTP server to be as close as you possibly can, right? So let's go back down here. Now it also shows here, um, let's see the current state is what they're showing there. Then I'm I'm, I'm not sure if that means is that in milliseconds or not. Um, this just a current state, and then the name and the IP address. In our case over here, we don't have a name; we have an IP address, right? Right here, we got an IP address. Over here, they got a name, classroomexample.com. But that's referring to DNS as well, too. And then they have right here, uh, where it's plus or minus offset. And I think that's, is that, is that, and it may be nanoseconds, right? I think that may be nanoseconds. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. nanoseconds. Yeah, nanoseconds. That's pretty good. Like, remember, we want to get as close to time as we can, right? And then the poll, right? Log two polling interval. Um, I'm not sure if the polling interval it, it should be, it should be in seconds, but it may be quicker than that. I think it's quicker than that. Let's go look at the crony C. Let's look at let's look at the actual 
uh, man page of Crony C. If not, I'll look up something else. All right. Let me see if it's if they got a breakdown here. Because I want to know host port version clock. I'm not sure if this poll is in. All right, so here. All right, here we go. All right. So we got M. This indicates the mode, the means of the server. The S, this is the column that indicates the selection state, right? And then uh, poll, let me scroll down here. Poll, this shows the rate at which the source is being polled um, as a log, as a base of log, base two logarithm of the interval in seconds. So it's in seconds. Uh, thus a value of six will indicate that a measurement is being made every 64 seconds. So two to the power of six is what they're saying. So chronic D uh, varies the polling rate in response to the prevailing conditions. So in our case right here is two to the two to the six is 64. So every 64 seconds, this is getting updated with time, right? That's what every one minute and four seconds, right? It's getting updated. And the same for this one here. And then let's look up, let's go back and look at man C, um, do a man on trying to see and what uh, reaches. Um, stratum reference, da da da. Root skew. All right, right here, reach. This shows the source, the source's reachability, the register printed it as an octo number. The register has it has eight bit, eight bits and is updated on every received or missed packet from the source. A value of 377 indicates that a valid reply was received for all the latest for all the last eight transmissions. Let's read again. The show this shows the source's reachability register printed in an octal number. So the register has eight bits. Okay, so eight bits. When they're talking about a register, <laughs> this gets complicated. You won't never ever need this, but let me go back up here. Can I do that? No, it won't let me do it. Okay, cool, fine. Let's get out of this mode. And let's go here. Let me show you when they're talking about a register. So when we're talking about memory, Register image. Basically, let's see, do they have a register on here? Yeah, they do have a register. Do, do, do. Basically, when they're talking about a register, they're just saying that and it's got eight bits, they're saying that information is being held in that register. Will you ever need this on the test? And will somebody ever ask you this in an interview? Probably not. Unless you work for NASA and I can see somebody asking you that. That makes sense. But that's what they're trying to say with that as a register. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, where my little thingy go? Oh, I know where it went. I'll pull it back up. No biggie. And then the last RX, I think that's trying uh, receiving, and then the nanoseconds, and then the sound. If you want to know more about Crony C, do the man pages, the Crony Conf, do that. On the exam, I think all you're going to need to know is how to set up the time zone time, date, control, how to set it up, how to control the time, how to set up the time. And you can get a good indication of that if you go to the lab. So let's go to the lab. All right, performance checklist. In this lab, you, you change the time zone on an existing server and configure a new log file for all the events for authentication failures. 
and then they walk you through what you should do and then they ask you a question from the workstation open up an ssh connection uh to serve a bean machine as student user and it's like oh we're not going to give you the answer you got to guess it right then it says pretend that server b machine is relocated to jamaica and you must update the time zone appropriately verify that you're correctly set the appropriate time zone remember we saw jamaica as uh, uh an option so time date ctl set um set time zone or is it it's, i think yeah set time zone and then jamaica and then display the recorded log events in the previous 30 minutes of server b so in our previous uh uh thing we sh we showed this right here we went over this one right here but you use the journal command to do to go from from one time to another time right and they just want to say in the last 30 minutes now mm -hmm. your time is going to be you know um you know it may be different on your on your machine so you need to look at the time and then go uh, according to that you can adjust it too right so the, here there's the date for 30 minutes and then they said 30 minutes on server b to um from since and then until and they were showing that there and then let's go back up here and show you the solutions here i think you probably knew you had the ssh to that machine and then here pretend that server b is relocated to jamaica all right so here's the they do tz select that's one way, right? And then you do Jamaica, but, oh, I need to bring it up. Let's go lab environment, in there, workstation. Oh, cool, brought it back. Uh, remember we did, um, let's do a history. This is another way that you can always grab your commands. You don't remember what you did? Um, oh, I didn't do it on here, huh? Uh, time, date, CTL. Right, then let me grab for Jamaica. And I'll do dash I. To ignore the case. And I hope I spelled Jamaica right. Did I spell that right? Jamaica. Okay, is that right? No. I knew that one. Right. Let's do jam. It'll grab it for me. There you go. So here we go. Um you got America, Jamaica, and then you got Jamaica. I think the I think this Jamaica is the one you're gonna use for TZ, TZ select, and then I think for time date control, this is when you would set it to this one. So time date CTL uh, set time zone, and then we'll do America Jamaica. And then we'll do a date. And then let's do a show. Um, let's do show. Let's do show. And we see that's Jamaica. And then we'll. I think the status. I think the status does give you a little bit different information, right? Yeah. Same thing, but there you go. Eastern Eastern time, same time zone, right? And for the time. Let me go back up here to the course. And that was it. This is the lab that I was just briefly walking through, leaving on leaving you all to do the lab. And when you get done with your lab, if you want to know how you did on your lab without looking at the answers, do a lab grade log review. And then this right here will reset the lab back to the original uh, default right so you can go to the next chapter and the next chapter for us is chapter 12. any questions no yeah it makes sense do you think you can do 
We can change the time. Am I talking to myself? Is anybody there? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's. I've done it. I've done it before, but uh, we use it for our GPS antenna for my um, for my uh, for my job, and so it's something that sometimes ends up drifting, and we have to verify that it's yeah. actually lined up with uh, where it's supposed to be. Yep, it drifts just like your time on your um. In your car, sometimes it, your, your time in your car drift, right? So. Yeah, our system requires GPS fix, so that's that's part of the reason why certain certain parts of the features don't work unless there's a fix. So yeah, it's, yep. it's very important, like you said. Yep. Another place where this comes up, where time drift comes up, if you're using triple SD, which is Kerbos for Linux and you're connecting out to say an Active Directory server or somebody needs to log into their machine. If the clock skew is more than five minutes, it won't let you um, log in. It'll keep the, the user in a loop. So one of the things you have to do is make sure that your time is set up on your, on your machine uh, for that. So don't drift, right? So it's best to have some type of ATP server on your network. Even at home, it's good, like with your, even though you know, your laptop can connect out to the world, but it's good to kind of keep all your packets, you know, internal to your inter to your network, right? You want you want um nobody getting in, but everybody can can get out that you allow to get out, right? All right, so networking. All right, so networking, this is gonna be with you for for eternity in, in tech. I don't care if you're an application developer or what have you, this is just gonna be with you. So in here, they're, they're describing um, network addressing and routing, um, test and inspect current network configurations. Um, they're using the M NMCLI, which is the uh, the command line version of this. There's also a, what we call a TUI, T-U-I version of this. And then uh, modify the configuration files. They configure a static name and its name resolution and test the results. Then they have a quiz, a guided exercise uh, for networking, a guided exercise, to configure, you gotta validate and then configure, and then here you're gonna edit the network configuration, and then you're gonna configure the host name of your actual machine, right? I think I think this one, the the last one, and the first two are probably gonna be your easiest two labs. I think the rest are gonna probably give you some trouble, right? Especially if you're not really familiar with it. All right, so I know we got some smart people in here, so. Um, I'm not going to um, call on people that are new, but I'm calling on the smart people. All right, so uh, Ronald, give me the, uh, give me the, give me all the layers of the OSI model. Is Ronald there? Yes. Who want to, who want to, who want to give Ronald a lifeline? Ronald, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. What's... Give me, give me the layers of the OSI model. Ah, uh, um. <laughs> like, what? Hold on, hold on. Uh, it's been a while since I worked on this. Uh, physical network transport. Uh, session. Session and up. No wait. Physical network transport session presentation and application. You forgot data. Data link. Um, data yeah. link. Uh, uh, wait, wait. Data link is right here. Data link is the second one. I know yeah. I was, that physical layer is the first because I, yeah. I physical layer. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna tell you what are the what are the most important layers that you're gonna probably always be checking first. 
probably these three right here. And then the next one will be the application. So these are gonna be always your thing, right? And then the application itself, right? And the reason why I say that is because sometimes somebody may be on the wrong network, they might've grabbed the wrong ethernet cable and plugged it into their laptop, or it's not getting the right network, or they log into the VPN and don't drop them where they need to be or what have you. Um, then this one right here, um, it, it could be a number of things. It could be the, uh, an actual uh, uh, bad subnet or the right here, the, the physical NIC card could be bad, especially when we got uh, flopping on a NIC card. So uh, flopping on a network card. Um, yeah, flapping, flopping. Yep. So going when they start when it, when you look at um say you had a desktop, you can look and see when the traffic is like going steady or it's like dropping. It's just intermittent, intermittent. Intermin I'm saying it all. It's all on my network. But you get what I'm saying. It's going back and forth and it's not um, steady, right? I don't know, Have do y'all ever, you ever be talking on your network and you got packets that drop when you're on your cell phone and you talking, somebody's trying to sound, somebody sound like a robot? Yeah, you're referring to U TCP and UDP, right? Yeah, oh, I'm referring to just packet loss. Yeah, when you're getting packet loss, right? So another thing is this TCP IP model, right? So let's go back up here where they start talking about everything. The TCP IP model, network model, is simplified four layer, four layered set of communication protocols that describe how data communications are packetized, addressed, transmitted, routed, and received between computers over a network. And so that's why I say this is going to be important to you because one of the questions that always get asked is, how does DNS work? What happens when you type in uh, google.com? How does the computer know to go to google.com? You know, what happens from your machine, um, from you, from your machine out? Like what happens, right? Um, and so one of the things is like, you have what we call a host file and you have a, a DNS name resolution. So usually the machine will look, look locally first and when it can't find anything, then it will reach out um, to the DNS server, but it starts local first and then reaches it out. But you know, what is it, how did, how did google.com get associated with, with, with a set of IPs and so forth? And when I say that, I'm talking about here, if I go here and I type in hostgoogle.com, you see I get an, I get an IP address back, and then I get some an SMTP, an SMTP server, and I also get um, the IPv6. If I type in host uh, gmail.com, you see I get a whole slew of information, right? Uh, and I expected me to get a lot of that because uh, how many email boxes does Google have, right? The Gmail, let's see. How many uh, Gmail accounts exist in the world? Let's see. 1.8 billion. 1.8 billion. Right, that's how many by 2020 the number of users has accelerated to 1.8 billion. That's the list for Gmail. Right, so now let's think about let's put this in perspective. How often are their email servers getting hit in a in a matter of seconds? Just think about how many how how many seconds you know how you know how many users. Accessing their email, 
right? And then um, how many users are sending emails? Um, how many users are getting attachments in their email, right? So when we're, when we're talking about this on a global scale, right? You don't think your NTP, your time will be important. When you get an email, you look at the time you got it, right? That time is important. Like how long has this been sitting in my box or something like that, right? All right, so let's go back. All right, so the application layer, um, this has uh, application specifications for communication on clients and servers can communicate across platforms, common protocols of SSH, HTTPS, FTP, SMTP. Transport, TCP, UDP. TCP meaning um, secure, UDP, unsecure, right? Connection versus connection list. Um, let me see. Uh, DHCP is a good, well, D DHCP can be used for TCP and UDP, but um, DHCP is um, often known for UDP. In other words, if I plug up my laptop, uh, I, it's going to send a broadcast out over across the network to say, hey, I need an IP address. Somebody give me an IP address. And I don't know if you've ever looked at the traffic for DHCP, but it's quite interesting uh, for DHCP. So let me show you that. Uh, DHCP uh, traffic. All right, so here we go. On what happens with DHCP. So I plug in my, I plug in my machine. I'm gonna do a broadcast on the network. So I'm gonna go out and discover, I'm gonna hit everybody. Who out there can give me an IP? And this is where UDP comes in because I'm just throwing it out there, right? I don't care where it lands, I just need what I need. And then um, as, it, as it gets out there, somebody says, oh, okay, well, you know what? I can offer you something, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna offer you something, right? And then once it get back to you, right? You know, you'll get it, you'll get that request out there. It get back to you, you'll get an acknowledgement, like, yeah, I take that. And then once you, once you, once you, once you receive that and take that, you'll get an IP address and a, um, and a subnet mask as well too. Um, here's another one that gives you like, I guess, like a breakdown right here. So a client broadcast to find uh, information. So I'll make that bigger here. And then somebody offers, right? The client requests offered a, a address and then acknowledge the server acknowledge that the client's request for an address for, for address information. And that's what happens every time you plug up your laptop, unless you all have on your networks that my MAC address is going to always get this IP or these servers on my network are going to, going to always get these IPs, right? Uh, depends on how you have your network set up. Um, typically, if you have your home computer or whatnot, I mean, your home router, you really only want to limit the number of uh, machines that can use DHCP, um, set them up to static. Uh, once you set them to static, you can then uh, monitor whenever a new IP address come up, you get the log probably like, I ain't never seen that IP address before. It's not, it's no MAC address assigned to that. Where is that coming from? Uh, you can block people who don't have a static IP, like, hey, the, if, if these five IP addresses can get out to the internet. These other ones can't, right? So it's a lot of little different things that you can do on your home network to secure yourself, right? And so UDP, DHCP is an example of UDP, right? Now, an example of TCP is SSH. I have, and I'm going over to, I'm SSH into this machine. 
I am using this particular DNS name or IP address. I'm having a secure uh, shell or secure protocol wrapped around it in order to connect. DCP is nothing secure about it. Anybody can be on the network and snip it out and see, oh, who MAC address is this? And then like, oh, that person got this IP address and so forth. And then they, then you can get into uh, spoofing and so forth, right? Then the internet, the internet uh, or the network layer carries the data from the source host to the destination, the IPv4 and IPv6, which I showed you before. And link is the link or the media access layer, uh, the connection to the physical media. And that's what they're talking about here. Like you physically plug in your laptop to uh, with an ethernet cable, maybe from the wall or something like that, or you're, you um, um, have your Wi-Fi set up to connect, right? That's the physical one. You gotta have some type of Wi-Fi controller inside your laptop for that to happen. Now it says here, we're gonna describe interfaces. All right, I want to make a note of this one right here, right here. In case you ever get on a machine and you're like, this is not how it looks on rail eight or nine. All right, um, the earlier versions of Red Hat used to use ETH zero, ETH one, ETH two. ETH zero name was the first network uh, port, the first physical uh, interface. And then and then so forth and so on. ETH one was the second one, then ETH two was the third one, right? Zero, one, two, three gives you three interfaces. And it says, however, as devices were added and removed, the mechanism mechanism that detach and name the devices would change, which would could change which interface was assigned to which name. Furthermore, the PC PCIe standard does not guarantee the order in which the PCI devices are detected on boot, which could change uh, device naming or unexpectedly due to variations uh, during the device or the system startup. In other words, um, I when I reboot, it's not guaranteed that I'm gonna get what I had back. That's what they're trying to show here. It's saying in row seven and later, the difficult naming system generates um names that are consistent across reboots so these eth0 eth1 is what you normally see and you can see it here um if i do like an ipa oh sorry clear let me do ipa and you can see here i got my eth0 and then i have my low for local host right but normally they'll come in as ENS192 or what have you. And so here they're showing a like network interface name start with ENWL and uh, worldwide, I guess it's world, I guess it's wide when worldwide when I'm not sure oh, what the WW is. I looked that one up. WW um, network. A uh, wireless wide wide area network, wireless wide area network. That's what it stands for, right? So it says the rest of the interface name name after the type is based on the information from the service firmware, right? So um, when they're talking about firmware, do y'all know the different network card makers? interface makers, different network inter interface makers. So different physical network interfaces. All right, so let's see, uh, brand names. Right, so here they got a list of like, uh, you heard of Cisco, Asus, D-Link is another one, HPE is another one, uh, Netgear, and then the list goes on, right? Uh, different uh, actual interfaces that you'll run into. Uh, let me see, network switches, wireless. Here we go, Cisco. Um, 
Buffalo Technology uh, Broadcom uh, Mel Melanit Melanox. Uh, I don't I didn't realize Oracle made network cards. I can see that. And you'll you can let me see if we can do a LS PCI. So here I did a LS PCI. What I did was uh, I just wanted to see what was on the PCI bus of this machine. And you can see here I have an Ethernet controller. Um, this is a virtual controller for Red Hat because I'm this is, these are probably VMs and not bare metal machines. But you can also see like who is um, the actual hard drive, um, the host bridge, maybe. But this gives you some information about your machine, all right? LSPCI, which gets into these down here. That's why I did that. The rest of the interface name type is based on the information from the server's firmware or, or determined by the location of the device in the PCI technology. I won't go into that because I don't think you're going to need that on the exam. I think you would need these on the exam. All right. So when I I'm clear when I type IPA, this is the actual IP address of the machine, right? 172.25.250.9. Uh, and it's a slash 24. What that tells me is I have a I have all I have my 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 first three octets on because it's a slash 24. And I'm gonna go back and show you the diagram, but I want to explain this to you first. So in total, I get 32 bits, right? Everything like eat when I say this in front of this death, each one of these decimals is is I get eight bits, and eight times four is 32 bits. All right or an IP address, right? And I'm not talking about IPv6, I'm talking about IPv4. I get a total of 32 bits that I can manipulate. And this slash 24 tells me that, well, you can manipulate all you want, but you can't manipulate this last octet because I got 32 bits and 32 from 24 is eight. So that tells me that my network address is off the rip is 172.25.250.x. Dot x meaning that I can manipulate numbers on the end, but whatever I do, my 172, my dot 25, my dot 250 is my network address because my slash 24 is telling me that, right? You keeping up with that? All right, let's get into it. All right, so here they said IP, IPv4 is the common addressing scheme in enterprise networks today. Now, they've been saying since 2000 that they, they were running out of IPs and they needed to move over to IPv6. And I don't see a lot of people using IPv6. Now, your telcos, they probably use it all the time, but us commoners like us, we're not we're not we're not doing routing in IPv6 unless unless the network is handling it for you, like somebody like Verizon or some AT and T or something like that's handling it for you. All right, it says you need a basic understanding of IPv4 networking. IP, I, IPv4 is a 32-bit number. We just talked about that. Four different octets. Right, and it says it's expressed as four eight bit octets in a decimal format that ranges from zero to 255 separated by dots. And that's what we saw right here from zero to 255 separated by dots. Right, and then it says, Go ahead. Tam, I was going to ask you, uh, 
Do you have a recommended IP calculator that you uh that you can suggest in order for us to be able to, to get details on a given IP address, like to see the subnet or the prefix that's associated with a given subnet? I'm I mean, old a given IP address. I'm old school. I do it by hand. <laughs> But you can't use a you can't use a calculator. Uh, usually the you you know usually your um usually some of the 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 newer interfaces for subnetting they do it for you. Like some of them, some of the applications do the subnetting for you. But there is an IPv4 calculator. Um, is this one I always use? No, not that one. I use I use this one. Right. So here I, I use this one. And the reason why I like using this one is oh, let me see. Is it gonna give my numbers? Yeah. All right. So here, I'm gonna blow it up. I just want to give me what the subnet, what that looks like. So here, when I talk about those octets, those octets, right? We get a total of 30, we get a total of 32 bits and divided into four octets. And it's eight bit per octet. That sounds and looks like this, 255, 255.255.0. That's my subnet mask or my net mask, right? And it says this, this 24, I know it's 32 in all, but they're telling me it's 24 in one. That means all three of those fields are filled with one. And this last field is filled with zeros because I'm, I'm going to manipulate that, right? And so in here, um, well, they didn't get into it yet, or I didn't see it yet. They got class. Class A, B, C, you got military, and then some other ones, right? But the ones you need to worry about is A, B, C. I don't think they're gonna, they're not, they're not gonna, nobody's gonna question you about what's the the classification for D, who you who uses that. Nobody's gonna ask you that. All right, so then what they're showing here, remember. When we talk in computer language, we talk in zeros and ones, binary. So that's why you see these represented in zeros and ones and not zeros, ones, threes, fours, and fives, right? Um, so here they're saying, hey, 192. All right. So now we got to talk in, in powers of two, right? So let's talk in powers of two. Uh, powers of two submit. I just want to see if I can get an image. Uh, yeah, let me look at this. One. Let me see. I am okay. Well, uh, mm, that's fine, but I'm looking for a particular thing and then we'll go back. I'm looking for a visual. Okay, here we go. That's what I want. So, the this is the conversion, right? So, we know we got eight bits. Right. And it starts with two to the zero. Well, two to the zero is one. Two to the first is two. And then multi keep multiplying. Four, eight, all the way up to 128. Right. And that's what they're trying to show you here. Right. So they're saying the value of each bit working from right to left. Right. So when we get back over here, is it this one? This one. They're trying to show you like each 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 position of this one means something. 
right? That's how they come up with the 255. Each one means something. It's a total of 256 minus one. Well, I, mean, I ain't going to say minus one. Mm, the zero to count, 255. Count, count is zero, yeah. Yeah, zero to 255, which is 256, right? So here they're trying to they're just trying to show you that each one of these bits is on for just 24. And then they have, and this is why I don't like subnetting this way, because I think it's so complicated. But I'm gonna explain it and then we're gonna go do the easy way. All right, so in this uh diagram, and then and I'll get back to it, they were trying to show you that you have to do what we call a logical end. So it's time to have some fun. I think you'll like this. Y'all ever heard of truth tables? No? Mm. What did you call it? A troop table. I'm telling you this the hard way. So here's a what we call a logical and. And a logical and says this. Basically, if I have zero and zero, meaning they both have to be Basically, they both have to be zero and zero. They both have to be zero. In this case, for the zeros, that means that it is zero. But if it's a zero and a one, then it's a zero. If it was a one and a zero, it's a zero. But if it was a one and a one, it's true. Basically, that's what it is. Those are what we call our logical and or our logic gates. And then I won't get into ors, but well, I like you like ors. So basically, you could be either true or false. If it's true, if it's if it's true or false, it's it's gonna lean towards true. That's how or works. But in our case, we want to focus on the end. So here, do 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 do. Where's my power table? Is it at? Oh, where'd it go? Oh, here. Here, this is how they do subnetting. I don't know anyone that actually sits down here and takes these numbers and writes them and write them out in binary. <laughs> and then write write the subnet mask in binary and then do a what we call a logical end on. I don't know anyone that does that. I don't know anybody that does that. Either somebody uses a calculator or they know how to do uh, what we call uh, subnet map, subnetting, right? So subnetting the easy way. So you can check out this guy. You learn how to subnet in seven in seven minutes. He's been around forever. Uh, I want to see if they have uh, how this one, how they have it laid out. Hold on. Oh, there they go with that with that bull crap of being. Let me see. No, they don't have it here. Mm, no, they don't have it here. Uh, they tell you what the slash notation is, but they don't have like, hey, if you have this, then this is how many networks you have. This is how many, um, this how machine, how many machines you have on the network. Here's the network ID and so forth. And that's what we're supposed to show you, but they don't show that here. 
I dropped this though because it gives a little bit information, but it don't get the information how I want to. I'm gonna have to look that up. That's why I didn't like this. This is the one chapter I didn't like. I didn't like how they broke it down. All right, let's get back over to this chapter. All right, so we got the 32 bits. We know that each octet is eight bits. All right, and it says the address is divided into two parts, the network prefix and the host number. The network prefix identifies the unique physical or virtual subnet. And we saw that when we did uh, the slash 24, we saw that we had the network and then that last octet was for us to choose a, um, a machine IP address you know, 192.168.1, and then we pick that three. All right, it says the host network identifies a specific host on the network. All the hosts on the same subnet have the same network prefix and can talk to each other uh, without a router, right? So I can set, if I'm at home and I don't have a router, right, I can set my machine to be 192.168.3, 192.168.1.3 and another one to be 192.168.1.4 and if you wanted to I think I think now you don't even have do people still buy crossover cables see Sam do y'all still buy crossover cables y'all just buy regular cables and don't even worry about it the interface nah, is for you nah nah we just have straight through uh the uh, they said that uh the crossovers were pretty much used for like Windows 7 and before, something like that. But okay. now nah, they say th straight through cables will work now, even with the older equipment, uh, okay. with the with the upgrades, the OS upgrades, they don't, they're not necessary. Okay, that's what I thought. So usually back in the day, we used to have what we call a crossover cable. So the crossover cable, I would plug into my machine, you would plug into your machine, um, and then we could talk. But now, we could just use one straight through cable, which is just your regular Cat 5 or Cat 6 cable if you want to, however you want to look at that. And then plug them directly in, give them, give me an IP address, give yourself an IP address, and we can, can, can communicate without a router. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to get out of the network. That just means we're going to communicate with each other for, for, for all intents and purposes, right? It says all hosts on the same subnet have the same network prefix and can talk to each other without a router. A network gateway connects the different networks and a network router commonly operates as a gateway for a subnet. So your home, your home uh, router does a lot of things. It, it also acts as a router switch as well. You, plug, you can plug your TV into it. You can plug your video games into it. You know, all these different things you can plug into it. You can go on, you can get on wireless. You know, your your home router does a, a, a whole lot of things. You can set it up for a VPN and everything. So it's pretty powerful from what it used to be to what it is. We used to have to get individual devices for a lot of that stuff, but it came a long way. Right? All right. Go ahead. Pam, what system assigns the, the IP addresses for a given device? So that so you can have your router act as a DHCP server. So your router can act as a DHCP server, and you can set up. And I don't know if you ever looked at your DHC or your your router. If you ever logged into your router, you'll see you'll have one for a guest network. You'll see you'll have one for a VPN and so forth. But your router acts as a DHCP server. So when you plug in. And it's, and it's also different too. Like if you physically plug in the, your your interface, your NIC, um, your Ethernet cable onto your laptop, if you still have that capacity to do that, you'll notice that you'll get an IP address, right? But if you go over wireless, you'll get a different type of IP address. It's because your wireless is running on uh, a different subnet than what it would be for your for your, what I like to call hardwire or wired in. And so it's, it's not the fact that um, you're gonna get different types of traffic. One, you're gonna get speed. 
It used to be that wireless was slower. And it can be sometimes. Sometimes it's good to plug directly in and, and go directly in and then go and, and then go over your network from there. Because again, you can have somebody spoofing your network on your wireless side. You can have somebody spoofing your, your, your router as well too. Remember, you're not the only person on your network um, when you have these routers. You're not the only person in the world on this network. You have other people that have a router, but y'all are all on the same network. Just remember that. All right, um, an IP network is partitioned to multiple smaller network segments, like I talked about, your wireless, and then your uh, physical. Typically, segment refers to physical or virtual link, while the subnet refers to the logical network layer addressing for corresponding segments. It says, uh, additionally, subnetting can subnetting an, an assigned large network address to be subdivided into smaller network segments. So you'll get that typically at your job. You know, you'll have your, this, your job is a great example. Right in the, in the office, your printers are are maybe on on a different uh, subnet, but um, they, I mean you may have printers on a different subnet. You may have TVs on one sub, on another subnet because they're they're constantly on and pulling data. Um, so it's always it, it's always about uh, segment segmenting your network, um, especially when you're at home, right? The IPv4 section introduces network addresses that are Im implemented as single subnets. The upcoming IPv6 section will include another context where large networks are subnet. Like they're, they're not going to ask. I don't think they ask about IPv6 on the, on the exam. All right. So here they're talking about original classes, A, B, A, B and C designation. It used to be more. They, they would talk about the military ones. You, you had to know that if you were doing your Cisco stuff, they would talk about that. And we talked about network mass. I won't go, I won't beat that up. But here, let's talk about this. Got five minutes. All right, calculating for IPv4 addresses and net mass. The number of available host addresses in a subnet depends on the network prefix size. For example, a network of slash 24 leaves eight bits. Now, this is how I submit that logical and and all of that. Mm -mm. So it leaves eight bits. We know we have a whole total of 32. So it leaves eight bits. All right. So a possible 255 host addresses in a subnet. A prefix network of slash 16. Leaves sixty, leaves sixteen bits, and that leaves you sixty-five thousand. And you want to know where they got that from, right? So, um, uh, go to a calculator. So if I did two, and I do a raise uh, to the sixteen. That's how they did it. Just remember, everything is in, in binary, right? So two to the 16. And then if I do two, and I raise that to the eight, that's 256. So that's how they came up with those numbers right there, right? Two raised to the eight and two raised to the 16. That's how many possible host addresses are available in the subnet. Right? It says the network address for a subnet is the lowest possible address on, on the on the subnet where the host uh where the where the host is 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 in all binary uh zeros. So what they're trying to say here is the network address for a subnet is the last is the lowest possible address on the subnet. So that 192, 168.1.5. The, with a slash 24, it is saying that the network address will be 192.168.1.0, right? 
because we got all 20, we got a slash 24, we got we got the first three octets are on, right? If it was a slash 32, that last octet would be on, and that would not be a network address that would be an actual host on there, an actual computer, right? It said the broadcast address, and then the broadcast address is, is what you use to broadcast the, the traffic, right? For the subnet, it's the highest possible address on the network where the host number is is all binary ones and is a special address for broadcasting packets to all the subnets like hey who got this let me get let me let me see you this right and then the gateway address for the subnet can be any unique not any unique host number in the subnet but it's commonly set for the first available host net host number now here is where you get complicated. So this right here is an IP address, 192.168.5.3. They've taken this IP address and converted it over to zeros and ones. Remember we go two to the zero and then two, uh, two to the one, which is two. So one plus two is three. So that's how they got three. And then how do you turn, how do you make five in binary, right? Two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two. So two to the two is four and two to the one, I mean, two to the zero is one. So four plus one is five. So then they say, how do you make 168? And then how do you make 192? Then they give you a subnet mask here, right? 255, 255, 255. So they have here, they take they take all this right here and they put this all down here and they're saying hey all of this right here is the network and, and this right here is the host and that's what they're trying to show you there and they said ipv4 net mass calculation for a small network and so remember when they was talking about network the network address for the subnet is the lowest possible address on the subnet where the host is 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 all the binary zeros right that's on that that's what they're showing you and then they do the same thing down here they take the one set they take the ip address and then they take the subnet mask right and they're showing you what that ip address will look like in binary and remember we have that binary over here right two to the zero two to the first two to the second two to the third all the way up and that's what they're doing here they're using that calculator or that that symbol right two to the zero two to the first and so forth and then they say okay well here is the network and then here is the host so they take in um this here and this here saying these in the network and then this piece right here is the host but we know that because it's a slash 16, so we know we got 16 bits left over right here. So network host, the number of hosts you get and the number of networks you're going to get. So for short, I don't like doing it this way. So I'm going to come back next week and show you how to do it the math way. How do you add and subtract? But you're going to have to learn how to calculate in the powers of two, two to the zero, two to the first, to the second, to the third, so you know how to manipulate stuff. And when I say that, um, say you get a subnet match, we've been doing slash 24, but say you get a subnet match of, of, of slash 20, how do you rep represent that subnet mask in a slash 20? How do you write that out? Um, how do you write out, uh, uh, 172.17.5.0 uh, slash 20. And how would you write slash 20 in binary? How would you calculate that out, right? What bits are on and what bits are off? Remember, the computer is nothing but binary. It's all in bits. Zeros and ones. And so they will walk through this. I don't, I don't like this way. I want to show you a different way because I think this is overly complicated, overly complicated. So we're going to come back next week and go over this.
Yeah, the way you explained it is, is better than anyone has ever told it to me before. I've always been wondering how people can quickly figure out how many how many uh, available uh, IP yeah. addresses are there. Yeah, so really it's, it's, it's more or less like once you figure out, once you start figuring out how many networks you have, then you can calculate how many hosts you're going to have per network, right? So where does this really come into play? At? It really comes into play, say you, you're building a building and you go into a building and you're networking up a whole building, but each floor may have a different, a different uh, subnet, right? Um, or it may have a different network depending on the floor, right? Uh, depending on how people lay it out. But think about, think about when you go into a hospital. Do if you sitting up there on a machine and the machine need to get an update and, and it gets an update and you go on the machine, you don't want the machine to come back and say, I, I don't have any available IPs or it can't find an IP and you need that machine. <laughs> you don't want to have that problem, right? So again, networking is super huge. It goes without it goes with you throughout your entire career, especially if you're doing anything tech related and when i say tech related let me clarify anything that deals with not just linux or windows but anything dealing with a database anything dealing with a interface a web interface uh even just your your email address right when you go type in when you go to gmail.com and then you log in right gmail.com has a ip address or a set of ips that correlate back to that right so you want to be able to um, uh, understand what's going on with your IPs, you know, being able to talk about it. Well, I'm gonna come up with another example because I don't like how, I don't like doing this logical end because that's really what they're doing. And I, I don't really too much care for that. I'd rather for you to be able to add and subtract. And most of the time, most people are gonna have, at work, you're probably going to, use a calculator but if you're in an interview you can ask the interviewer hey can i use a calculator or not and they'll probably say yes or no and they, but they want to know especially if you're a network engineer they want to know do you at least know how to do uh submitting 